Hi, um, welcome to the Weatherhead East Asian Institute. For it. We're very honored today to welcome Mr. Noriyuki Shikata, who is currently research associate at Harvard University, um, to speak about Japan's diplomacy in 2030. Um, let me just briefly, um, I'm, my name is Takako Hikotani. I am the um, associate professor here at Columbia University. Please let me introduce Mr. Shikata. Um, Mr. Shikata holds a BA in law from Kyoto University and MPP from Harvard Kennedy School. And prior to his position, he was the um, deputy chief of mission at the Embassy of Japan in China. And he has a very extensive career in the Japanese Foreign Service. But rather than just reading the whole thing, let me just note that what might be of interest to you is that he was the um, spokesperson for the Japanese government when the 311 earthquake hit. So that is a very abbreviated introduction of Mr. Shikata, but I think we would prefer to ask him to speak um, right away. So um, he will be speaking for about 30, 40 minutes. Um, Professor Jared Curtis, um, uh, Professor Emeritus, Columbia University will comment and we will open the floor for discussion and question and answers after that. So without further ado, um, please let me turn the mic to Mr. Shikata. Well, thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction. Uh, I'm uh, very glad to uh, come to uh, this uh, weather, Weatherhead, you know, East Asian uh, Institute uh, at uh, Columbia, Columbia University coming from uh, Weatherhead Center for International Affairs uh, at Harvard University. So, uh, of course, uh, uh, we are kind of uh, relatives uh, or brothers or sisters. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, as I understand, Harvard University's uh, Center for International Affairs uh, got this uh, name of uh, Weatherhead Center uh, in, uh, I guess, in 1998. And uh, uh, this uh, institute, uh, Weatherhead uh, East Asia Institute, was uh, uh, the name was assumed in 2003, according to your website. So, so uh, I guess you know Harvard uh, Weatherhead Center is a bit uh, uh, older, uh, maybe older brother. So, anyhow, I I'm very glad you know to come here and uh, uh, actually today's uh, topic of. Uh, uh, Japan's diplomacy in 2030 is something that uh, Professor Curtis uh, assigned uh, to me. Uh, we had a, a talk, uh, the kind of panel discussion at Harvard uh, uh, last fall uh, with uh, Professor Curtis and myself, uh, Professor Christina Davis, and uh, uh, and also uh, uh, Professor Philip uh, Lipsy. Uh, from Toronto uh, coming on board. And uh, we discussed at uh, that time, you know, Japan by 2030. And, and I was uh, kind of in charge of uh, uh, Japan's foreign policy in 2030. And, and uh, uh, today I'm kind of trying to uh, extend um, my uh, kind of presentation at that time. And I have a bit more time. Now, of course, uh, at the same time, when we are talking about uh, after 10 years, uh, like we don't know what, what's going to happen to coronavirus uh, next week, right? So how, how could we accurately predict you know, what's going to happen you know, 10 years later? Uh, it's, it's going to be very challenging. Uh, but uh, there, there may be you know, some trends uh, that uh, uh, I can discuss and, and uh, based on uh, my personal viewpoints, I'm, I'm kind of strictly uh, expressing my opinions based on my personal views uh, today, and uh, I wish to discuss, you know, some of uh, the kind of risks uh, that uh, Japan may be facing uh, toward uh, 2030, and and, and also um, possible, you know, ideal, you know, scenario. So, uh, like you know, coronavirus. We need to be prepared, you know, for worst case scenario. But of course, we need to also think of, think about, you know, what could be uh, an ideal, you know, course of uh, uh, scenario based on uh, uh, our own efforts. So the future can be influenced, changed uh, by by our by our own efforts. And. Uh, uh, at the outset, I wish to uh, say that I, 
I will be discussing the uh, following five issues. Number one, Japanese society and, uh, uh, and susti sustainable development goals, which has 2030 as, a, the, the, uh, as its uh, date uh, of goals. And number two is a, a Japanese external environment in, in Asia and beyond. And number three, U.S. Alliance, uh, and especially uh, free and open in the Pacific. Number four, China. Number number five, North Korea. So, uh, so number one, uh, Japanese society and uh, uh, sustainable development goals. Um, of course, before getting into discussion of the the Japanese diplomacy uh, by 2030, uh, I need to think about uh, Japanese society uh, in 2030, because the society is the foundation of uh, uh, its nation's uh, diplomacy. And of course, everybody talks about uh, uh, Japan's, Japanese society's uh, challenge of uh, Asia. Uh, one estimate uh, says that the Japanese population will decline uh, from the current uh, about 125 to 100. 15 uh, million, and, and so we are talking about possibility of uh, uh, 10 million people uh, declining uh, in, in Japan. A and uh, uh, the major issue facing us is uh, could the Japanese industry, economy, social system be sustainable uh, under those kind of declining population? So, th so this is, a, I guess, a major risk. Uh, that Japanese society could be facing. But of course, there, there are uh, new opportunities. Uh, you know, because you don't have uh, as many productive you know, labor force as, uh, as uh, we, we have been you know, during uh, uh, post-World you know, post War II uh, era, uh, Japanese companies will be obliged to make uh, more aggressive use, proactive use of uh, technologies uh, in order to compensate you know, for shortages of uh, workers. And, and of course, you know, that would uh, uh, transform uh, the Japanese industry and how companies uh, will uh, operate. And, and uh, in many cases, you know, robots or AI you know, would be replacing you know, some of uh, those uh, uh, labors. At the same time, uh, we cannot only uh, depend on technologies. Uh, I guess uh, as a Japanese, I think that it is very important for, for us to reassess what's the strength or, or uh, the quality uh, that the Japanese society can provide in terms of art or food or culture uh, and, and so forth. So uh, that could be, you know, that kind of a reassessment of our society could be done by the Japanese and also uh, non-Japanese people as well. So we could be talking about, you know, possibility of uh, making use of uh, Japanese uh, soft power or smart power uh, coming from Harvard, you know, Professor Nye's uh, uh, concepts uh, could uh, be resonating. And uh, uh, so from this perspective, I, I was trying to think uh, whether uh, these uh, SDGs uh, that I mentioned briefly at the, at the outset may be providing some opportunities uh, for Japan uh, for uh, 2030. Um, I, I have a kind of basic question to you. Uh, have you heard about SDGs? Okay. Uh, anybody can explain uh, what SDGs are? How many goals are there? 17, yes, 17. Can, so, so can you uh, tell us about you know, what they are, 17 goals? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For example, uh huh. Poverty, yes. Uh huh. Uh huh. Environment. 
food. Yeah. Sure, sure. So, so those are the, the issues. Uh, of course, uh, 17 is kind of too many, and, and it's kind of almost impossible to remember you know, those, those 17s. And, and it starts with uh, no poverty, zero hunger, uh, good health and well-being, quality education, gender equality, clean water and sanitation, affordable and clean energy, decent work and economic growth, industry innovation and infrastructure, reducing inequality, sustainable cities and communications, climate actions, peace, justice, and strong institutions. I'm dropping some of them. And, and so, so there are quite a few uh, goals you know, that, that we need to work on. But actually, uh, when I take a look at uh, uh, these uh, 17 goals, uh, I, I personally think that you know, there, are, there are many areas uh, where uh, Japan can uh, contribute. And, and of course, uh, uh, I'm uh, honored today to be sitting next to uh, uh, Professor Curtis and uh, how it was like in Japan in the 60s or 70s. You know, we were still kind of developing. You know, we, we were uh, getting a World Bank you know, loans you know, to build uh, Shinkansen, right? So, so we have our own uh, challenges of uh, development during the post-war era, and we also suffer you know, from uh, uh, environmental issues, especially air pollution in Kaichi, Kawasaki, among others. So uh, Japan as a society has been going through the challenges of uh, achieving sustainable de development. And, and there are a number of areas you know, where uh, Japan can you know, make uh, extra efforts uh, to contribute to these uh, SDGs. And, and um, I, I think in Japan, there, there is a kind of better or increase awareness of uh, SDGs. And uh, we talk in terms of uh, five Ps, you know, to put it more simply, uh, people, planet, prosperity, peace, and partnership. A and uh, those are the, some of the major concepts. And uh, <coughs> Keitan Ren, uh, Federation of uh, Japanese uh, uh, Business, is uh, coming up with a uh, uh, the new concept called the uh, Society 5.0 for SDGs. And uh, uh, so Society 1.0 is hunter-gatherer society, 2.0 agr agrarian society, number three, industrial society, four, information society, and now we are into a new era. And uh, uh, so Japanese business, business is trying to interpret SDGs for the new era. And uh, this could translate into uh, uh, a new uh, opportunities. And today, uh, I'm also very uh, uh, glad to see uh, uh, Professor Keiko Honda. And she has been uh, working as a, uh, has been serving as a, a head of uh, international organization called MIGA. And, uh, uh, that international organization uh, has been uh, investing and engaging with the rest of the world. Uh, and and uh, I, I believe you know, that, that there, is, there is much to do with the SDGs. Uh, I don't need to kind of uh, explain uh, in front of her, but, but uh, my uh, sense is that uh, uh, if you're a Japanese uh, business uh, uh, community, uh, there is uh, a better awareness of uh, such concept uh, as uh, ESG. Has anybody heard uh, ESG before? Can you explain? Oh, okay, good, good. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure, you're you're right. So, uh, oh, okay. Yeah, environment, social, and, and uh, uh, governance. So, uh, uh, increasingly, 
uh, many uh, companies are making investments based or, or financial uh, institutional uh, investors are making their judgment you know, based on some of the criteria, uh, whether those uh, companies are taking into account you know, the principles of protecting the environment, or social justice, or governance, among others. So, so this is something you'd probably be able to learn from uh, Professor Honda's uh, uh, class. And, and, uh, <clears throat> and I'm saying this <clears throat> because uh, I think you know, this will be uh, very important, you know, not only, of course, not only in Japan, uh, but for the United States too. And, and uh, uh, UN uh, comes up with a, a kind of ranking of uh, individual countries' achievement of uh, SDG goals. And uh, uh, it, it's very interesting, you know, that uh, uh, the, you know, like, Japan is uh, like number 15. Uh, it's, it's not the, you know, the top you know, uh, ranked uh, countries. But uh, there are not many non-European countries among the top 20. And uh, uh, so those countries like Denmark, Sweden, uh, and Nordic countries are among the top uh, you know, players in, in this ranking. And uh, the United States is actually number 35. And, and so, in another word, you know, there there is much room to make efforts, and, and uh, maybe SDGs uh, could be regarded as something which is more deeply rooted in European uh, value system, and uh, uh, may, maybe uh, this SDG goals are pro you know, presenting uh, new opportunities for Japan uh, to change itself and to realize sustainable development through new innovations. And um, I, I will be just uh, to, uh, moving on to uh, another issues of um, uh, Japanese external environment. Of course, uh, uh, in uh, Japan is in uh, challenging uh, security uh, situations. Of course, you know, we have North Korea, the rise of China, there are issues like Taiwan, Hong Kong, Russia, and uh, uh, I guess, you know, we would be able to say that the, the security uh, or military security landscape uh, in East Asia is still, you know, quite challenging. A and um, so how could we manage uh, the Japanese security landscape is uh, one issue, you know, which will uh, remain very important uh, by 2030. But at the same time, you know, turning our eyes to a broader picture of uh, the global economy, uh, there are some, you know, like uh, predictions about uh, the world economy in 2030. And uh, one that I saw, uh, PwC's uh, top GDPs in the world are projected to be number one, China, US, India, Japan, and Germany. And uh, uh, Goldman Sachs uh, coming up with a different uh, uh, forecast, China, US, India, Brazil, and Japan. Brazil and Japan are about the same uh, level. So anyway, you know, these, you know, Four out of uh, five biggest economies uh, are projected to be in the Asia Pacific or Indo Pacific region. So by 2030, we'll be seeing the uh, arrival of Indo Pacific century. A and um, so, how, how are we uh, coping you know, with this uh, new uh, landscape? And, and those are like you know six countries uh, economies that I mentioned. Uh, among those, uh, there are non UN uh, Security Council uh, members, uh, which are India, Japan, Germany, and Brazil. Right. So it, it, by 2030, is there a need you know for reform of uh, UN Security Council? 
Let me just uh, uh, briefly touch upon the issues of uh, uh, US-Japan uh, alliance. Of course, uh, uh, from the Japanese perspective, uh, uh, we say that the uh, US-Japan alliance is the cornerstone of uh, Japanese uh, security policy. And uh, we have just celebrated uh, 60th anniversary uh, of this alliance. So maybe you know, looking back the global history, uh, you may not be able to find so many alliances you know, that lasted 60 years. And, um, uh, and as I mentioned, given the security landscape in uh, Asia, uh, missile threat, you know, coming from North Korea or nuclear missile threat or uh, Chinese activities in East China Sea or South China Sea. And more importantly, when Indo-Pacific will be the center of global economy, how the United States will engage this region is critically important. And um, uh, I'm glad, you know, that uh, under the Trump administration, you know, this concept of uh, free and open in the Pacific is uh, embraced by both the United States and, and Japanese government. And, and as you probably know, uh, Prime Minister Abe started to talk about, the, you know, this uh, Indo-Pacific concepts uh, in August 2007, when he visited India and gave a speech at the Indian parliament, uh, talking about confluences of two oceans, meaning the Pacific and, and uh, uh, the Indian uh, Ocean. Uh, I accompanied uh, uh, Prime Minister Abe at that time to India. And of course, you know, this uh, FOIP free and open in the Pacific idea was announced by Prime Minister Abe in uh, uh, August 2016, when he attended uh, TICAD, you know, Tokyo International Conference for African Development in Kenya, uh, and uh, he was talking about you know, this uh, new uh, concept. And, and many people uh, think that you know, because of uh, Indo-Pacific, Indo-Pacific idea you know, must uh, be centered uh, around India, but, but it is not. We are talking about Indian Ocean, and of course you know, India uh, could be a very important player. So um, this, we, of course, as Japanese, we are attentive to how the United States foreign policy and security policy uh, will evolve you know, during the next 10 years. And, and uh, this is uh, critically important, not only for uh, the global stability, but uh, in order to ensure uh, the, the, the world economy would be in good shape with a prosperous Indo-Pacific region. So that's why we are emphasizing our cooperation in terms of uh, securing freedom of navigation. Japan so much dependent on the oil coming from the Middle East at this point of time. It, it is, you know, the Japanese economy is a too large extent dependent upon uh, the peace across the two oceans. Uh, next one about uh, uh, China. I was based in uh, Beijing until uh, last uh, summer, and um, I, I was I have been working on uh, the kind of rapprochement between uh, uh, Tokyo and Beijing. Uh, I personally think you know that uh, uh, the situation that we saw in the fall of 2012, uh, very heightened tension, which lasted uh, nearly two or three years, had started to kind of calm down. And uh, uh, although uh, from the, the Japanese viewpoint, we are still concerned about, say, Chinese activities in East China Sea, we haven't really seen major progress uh, uh, in terms of uh, issues uh, in uh, East China Sea. But still, it's great uh, to see that uh, Prime Minister Abe and the President Xi are talking to each other and dis are discussing issues of uh, 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 you know, 
common you know, interest. And um, uh, so, for example, we tend to focus on um, uh, US-China trade war. Uh, but of course, Japanese companies in China have similar concerns you know, regarding uh, intellectual property rights protection. When you see, say, uh, manga or anime uh, published in Japan after a few days, translated into Chinese uh, and uh, uh, without the uh, you know, protection of IP rights. You know, that's uh, a major economic loss. At the same time, you could argue that you know, you, probably uh, the rising popularity of Japanese anime uh, in China is a good thing you know, for uh, Japan-China relations. But, but at the same time, uh, we Japanese business has similar concerns as uh, American or European uh, companies, and we need to address, you know, those issues. You know, th those are the common agenda items. And of course, uh, uh, th there are uh, risks uh, involving uh, the Ch uh, Chinese landscape. Uh, we, we don't know how long, you know, President Xi, Xi Jinping will be in power. Uh, next, you know, Critical date could be a uh, year, could be 20, uh, 2022, and next one would be 2027. So, what would happen uh, during you know uh, those years, and and also uh, by 2030, I guess you know made in China 2025 uh, would be completed, and uh, uh, we would you know we don't know what may be happening. Uh, as related to U.S.-China so-called, you know, technology uh, war, you know, if there is any. Of course, uh, uh, China has uh, come up with a next generation AI development plan, uh, which was published already three years ago. And uh, China is aiming at 2030 to develop uh, 6G. And the uh, uh, U.S. and the Jap uh, Japanese uh, governments are also uh, talking in those terms. So, so there will be competition. Uh, as long as it's a healthy competition, it would be uh, okay. And of course, you know, China will be facing uh, major issues of uh, demography, and and, uh, uh, and it's impacted, you know, by one child policy uh, between japan and china we have been uh, discussing uh, our cooperation uh, in the area of uh, uh, aging society and medical cooperation uh, among others actually um, the first major uh, project that the japanese government worked on vis-a-vis uh, -vis china was uh, to build uh, China-Japan Friendship Hospital uh, in Beijing. And uh, this is something that uh, was uh, established uh, with, uh, I guess at that time, Prime Minister Ohira, I think. And it was the, uh, the major grant aid you know, pro uh, uh, project. Uh, so after uh, Mr. Deng Xiaoping's you know, reform and opening up, and, and Japanese government started to extend, you know, uh, significant ODA program, Japanese business coming to uh, China and so forth. I'm glad to say that, you know, watching uh, news from China uh, under this uh, coronavirus, uh, you know, those doctors, you know, from uh, that specific hospital, uh, China, Japan, Friendship Hospital, uh, having press conferences to explain uh, about the situation. Uh, that hospital is very famous for infectious uh, diseases, probably one, one of the best one in China. And uh, uh, between Japan and China, we, we host, uh, organized uh, the infectious uh, disease uh, workshop, invite, inviting uh, Southeast Asian uh, doctors too, or uh, public health uh, professionals. So that's the kind of area we are uh, there is uh, more opportunity uh, for uh, cooperation. So, of course, you know, it depends on how, you know, Chinese uh, political landscape will develop. 
how U.S.-China relations will develop over years. Uh, but for the time being, um, the, the Japanese government or Prime Minister Abe is still waiting for uh, President Xi Jinping to, to come to Japan. To Japan. Uh, and uh, uh, this is something uh, which may give uh, new opportunities uh, for uh, uh, the next stage of uh, Japan-China uh, relations. And very lastly, uh, on North Korea. Um, so, so the question is, will North Korea still continue uh, its uh, nuclear and missile you know, programs uh, under authoritarian regime? And uh, uh, this is something uh, we, uh, you know, we are hopeful you know, that, that these issues of concern surrounding uh, uh, North Korea will be resolved you know, by 2030. Of course, denuclearization uh, process requires uh, some years, several years, you know, kind of long time, uh, long time. And, uh, but Prime Minister Abe has been making clear uh, that uh, uh, the Japanese government uh, still uh, honors uh, Pyongyang Declaration of uh, 2002 when uh, Prime Minister Koizumi visited uh, Pyongyang. And uh, uh, so the, the Japanese view is that if issues of concern such as abduction, nuclear missiles are comprehensively resolved, uh, Japan uh, will aim to normalize its relations with North Korea. And, and uh, uh, Mr. Abe has been saying, you know, especially in order to address the issue of abductions, uh, he uh, is uh, willing to meet with uh, uh, Mr. Kim Jong-un. So, of course, uh, uh, the Japanese uh, viewpoint in accordance with the UN Security Council resolutions, which require North Korea to abandon all the weapons of mass destruction, all, all range of ballistic missiles based on complete, verifiable, reversible destruction, CVID. So uh, this is something we need to continue uh, to work uh, closely with the United States and other uh, like-minded countries. So I stop here, thank you very much. Well, that was just a, a, a brilliant presentation, uh, so <clears throat> we're, all very, we're all very grateful. Um, uh, I don't really have anything that came, that you said that I would disagree with. What I want to do is, is push you a little bit on what are the options Japan has on two major, the, key, the two key issues it faces now to 2030 and beyond. One is the demographic dilemma, and the other is security policy. So, you know, the demographic um, uh, uh, problems that, or the demographic change that Japan faces, you're all aware of it, basically. Shrinking population, aging population. <clears throat> I lived in Japan for the first time at the, at the last Tokyo Olympics in 19, 1964. In, in that year, 6% of the population was over the age of 65. Today it's what, 25, 26%? And it's going up. Uh, so, and the projections of population shrinkage in Japan, this gets beyond 2030, but by 2045 or so, the population expected to shrink to about 98 million. That was the population in 1964. but. In 1964, it was 90, it was actually 97 million people in which young people dominate. Now you have a, a country in which old people uh, will be the, 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 not only the largest number, but they're also the largest voting bloc uh, with, with a lot of political, of political influence. So there are many aspects to this issue of how you deal with this demographic dilemma. One is, what can you do to reverse the trend or to slow the trend of decline? Uh, and the answer is obvious. Increase the birth rate, easy to say, 
not so easy to do. Um, uh, and having immigration, not easy to say because in Japan you don't say immigration. The word is kind of a, it's still a taboo word. Uh, but you have more foreign guest workers and so on, but not enough to make a big difference. Uh, so there's that problem. But, there's a, but I want to raise a different issue. It relates to sustainable development and to Japanese economic policy. This demographic uh, uh, change means that you have a shrinking market inside Japan. And Japanese companies that want to be successful will increasingly, and are increasingly, moving outside Japan and trying to adapt, uh, adapt uh, artificial intelligence, robots, other technological um, self-driving self trucks um, and cars, ways to reduce the need for human labor. But this raises all kinds of, 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 of serious problems. The combination of globalization and technological advancement feeds back into the domestic politics and society, right? Just as we see in the U.S. Why is Trump so, so popular, at least among his, you know, half the population uh, supporters? Why is, is, is Bernie Sanders likely to be the Democratic nom nominee? It has a lot to do with people being angry, being frustrated, being mad in a way we've not seen uh, before in the post war in the post war post war period, so when it comes to so in Japan, this seems to me, and this will I'll figure out how to make this into a question rather than uh, in a little in a little speech. But it seems to me that the combination of population decline, aging, technology technology advancement, and globalization is feeding back in already in Japanese society, but will do more so to exacerbate inequality. Because the people who are successful are people who can compete in a global economy, people who can manage artificial intelligence and, tech, and technology, uh, not the people on the assembly, on the assembly line, um, uh, assembly line uh, workers. So, Japan has been proud and has good reason to be proud of its post-war history of relatively equitable distribution of income and distribution of wealth. That is changing. And these demographic developments and the, the, react, the, need, the need for companies to become more global, the need for and the result being that more and more high value work is sort of outside the country or to a limited number of Japanese inside, leaving a lot of other people in, in much uh, in, in, in poor shape. This is a new issue. This is a new problem. And it's, I don't see the Japanese government grappling with this issue with the sense of urgency that um, uh, it requires. You know, 2030 is not far away. Um, you know, 10 years goes by pretty, pretty quickly. So that's sort of the first set of, uh, the, 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 that's the question. So the question is, well, I just apply with the question. How do you think the, the society as a whole and the government in particular, how strong is the awareness that these changes are not just something you wring your hands about, uh, but actually are creating new social problems, have the potential to create very serious social problems in Japan, and how is the government doing that? I'll, why don't you respond to that, and then I'll, I'll raise a second. So, um, well, I, I, I share uh, your uh, concerns uh, in the sense that uh, uh, demographic uh, issues uh, present uh, uh, really significant challenges you know for the Japanese society and, and uh, uh, I think you know what the uh, Prime Minister Abe has been uh, trying to tackle uh, has been uh, based on this uh, recognition you know that uh, we will be having a more challenging situation for years to come um, of course one uh, way to do it is uh, uh, to Kind of make best use of our own resources, and and, and I guess uh, 
uh, womenomics is something uh, which uh, Mr. Abe has been uh, promoting. Of course, uh, we we haven't you know achieved uh, the kind of highest categories of uh, uh, gender equality uh, in in our society. So we have lots of homework you know to do. Uh, but uh, uh, I think you know this is something that uh, will be. Uh, seeing being accepted in the Jap Japanese society and also more um, broadly about the uh, diversity uh, issues uh, just you know as an example of uh, uh, sports uh, uh, area you know, like athletes uh, I guess most Japanese are very proud of uh, having a competitive uh, uh, rugby World Cup uh, team and, and uh, uh, so so the captain is uh, uh, Richie Michael, right? So, so, uh, and it's a it's a very uh, diverse uh, uh, team. Uh, Matsushima Kotaro sounds very Japanese, but you know he uh, he his uh, father is uh, Zimbab uh, uh, from uh, Zimbabwe. Or of course, you know people like Osaka Naomi, tennis player, or Hachimura Rui, uh, who is now uh, in Washington Wizards. Uh, they they are. Uh, getting uh, so much popularity among the Japanese, and, and maybe this could uh, facilitate uh, uh, the Japanese uh, society to embrace a new kind of Japanese, new concept of being Japanese, and um, uh, and that is uh, probably uh, conducive to uh, the policy of. Uh, uh, as uh, Professor Curtis mentioned, you know, guest worker policy. Of course, Japanese government has been saying that you know we will not accept uh, so-called you know unskilled labor or simple labor uh, to the Japanese society. But uh, what he did, uh, what, what the uh, Abe administration decided, is that uh, uh, we we are uh, coming up with numerical targets, uh, three hundred forty-five thousand in five years. It's not a huge number, but uh, that's something we are uh, moving into a new era of uh, uh, through uh, the administrative reform uh, and uh, uh, reforming our uh, immigration bureau uh, into a new uh, agency. So, uh, so th this is going to be a continuous uh, process. Uh, at the same time, <clears throat> um, having lived in, in China, I, I have been feeling, you know, that uh, so many of my uh, Chinese friends, you know, want to go to Japan. And uh, uh, last year, we have seen nine million Chinese people coming to Japan. And uh, uh, so, during the last several years, every year, one more million uh, Chinese people are coming to Japan. And uh, uh, so I wonder, you know, why, you know, what's the reason for this? Um, my assumption is that, you know, Japanese society is uh, providing something, you know, which uh, could be a dream or the quality of life uh, uh, for, you know, many in, you know, the foreign tourists uh, in Japan. And so those uh, could be uh, translated into a new... Uh, business opportunities, economic opportunities beyond, you know, uh, mere you know, simple uh, tourists. You know, uh, tourist. um, very lastly, about in inequality issue, um, I guess having lived in uh, the U.S. and uh, uh, and U.K. Uh, during the last uh, uh, eight years. Uh, I feel, you know, this uh, divide in the society uh, at this point of time uh, seems to be relatively uh, not, you know, significant in the Japanese society. Uh, we don't have a similar issue, you know, debate such as a Brexit or the, the American political, you know, uh, debates of. Uh, uh, the, the political divide in the society. Uh, of course, you know, as uh, Professor Kati says, you know, it may emerge and, and uh, we need to be attentive. And that's why I think uh, uh, 
Prime Minister Abe has been taking a kind of gradual uh, approach. Uh, when we have more foreign guest workers, we need uh, the kind of a, a preparedness as a communities. And, and we are learning some lessons uh, from, uh, uh, say, Nikkei workers from Latin America uh, in the 90s. Uh, and uh, uh, so we don't want to create uh, the social problems. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the Japanese economy needs uh, the supply of uh, uh, foreign workers, you know, coming to Japan. And, and also, very lastly, um, probably we need to work uh, more on our educational reform. Uh, we, we need to have more international stu students coming to uh, uh, Japan. And, and I hope that uh, many of you who are students, uh, well, you know, even you are Colombia, would have a uh, uh, chance to, to come to Japan. And um, so this is something uh, we need to work on. And, and frankly speaking, uh, I think you know, we, have, we have so much uh, homework to do. But at the same time, um, as uh, those of you who have visited Japan in recent years know, when you go to convenience stores, uh, you know, th there could be more chance that you'll be talking to non-Japanese uh, uh, workers and, and uh, they are fluent in Japanese. So meaning they have studied Japanese and, and they are increasingly employed you know, by Japanese companies. Good, thanks. So just on, on all this, it seems to me the direction of change in Japan is very positive for all the reasons he just mentioned. The speed of change in Japan is very slow. While the world is changing fast, Japan is changing slow. So the gap between where Japan is at and where the world really needs Japan to be at is growing wider, not narrower. Uh, and I don't see that being, being resolved in the next 10 years, and, uh, at least. Uh, and one reason, the point he just made is an important point. You have populism in the U.S. You have these right-wing movements through Europe. You have, pop, you know, these kind of populist, semi-authoritarian uh, personalities and power, but not in Japan. And one reason is that the Japanese government does a lot to make sure that that kind of of anger and frustration and resentment doesn't emerge by having a budget deficit that's what 250 percent of gdp so that they can keep on providing health care providing pensions providing social services that you can't really afford and avoiding the need for major structural reform so Abe has been in, been prime minister this, this time around since 2012 has he in, engaged in fundamental reform of the health care system the pension system or, or, or much of anything else of so-called elapsed the answer and i've been biased my sense is no so you can do this keep on doing this for a while but at some point the chickens will come home to roost uh and that is the concern about the future now let me just ask you about security issue that's a big area so we can't get into a lot of it but it seems to me japan's options are so limited and the choices are becoming increasingly difficult limited in the sense that what is the alternative to heavy dependence on the u.s alliance for japanese security it seems to me the answer is there is no option there is no alternative align with china instead of the u.s not by 2030 <laughs> certainly uh go do it go alone there's no there's no stomach for that in, in, in the japanese public for uh, a major military buildup and uh, uh, what you could think of as being kind of in Israel in Asia. That's my vision of this, this option for Japan. You have the alliance with the U.S., but you basically depend on yourself. You have nuclear weapons. It's not happening. This is very unlikely to happen. So one of the issues you face is if you're so dependent on the U.S., what, how confident can you be that this that the U.S. will live will uh, provide that the U.S. commitment to Japan 
will remain critical. Frankly, I think it probably will. But you know, if you if you have a choice between Donald Trump and 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 Bernie uh, Sanders, both of whose views on alliances are very much at odds with the whole history of U.S. Japan of, of American foreign policy since the end of the Second World War, you have a problem. Now, just let me make two other points, and then I'll, and then I'll, I'll turn it back to you. How does Japan position itself between the U.S. and China? I think Prime Minister Abe has done a pretty effective job of, of being very close with Trump and yet pursuing a somewhat different, certainly a different line vis-a-vis -vis China and, and more generally, TPP, first, you know, becoming a, a leader in, in pushing for TPP 11, um, so forth, and, uh, so forth and so on. But on the U.S., if U.S.-China relations can continue to deteriorate, at some point, and you know, and both the Democrats, and the Republicans, there's kind of a bipartisan consensus that China is the big threat that we have to sort of resist its its further its further growth. Uh, if at some point, Japan may be find may find itself in a position where it's forced to choose. You can't if you choose the U.S. Alliance, what happens to your whole economic foreign policy? Uh, I think there's a very difficult issue, and I think here again, well, not again, but here the Japanese government is basically, <clears throat> and the business business leaders that I speak to, they understand that this is an issue that may will come, will they'll have to deal with someday. But let's hope it's not today, <laughs> and it's not tomorrow, and we'll worry about it when we have to. I understand that. I'm kind of sympathetic to, to that view, but. Uh, it's a very serious question. And then finally, on North Korea, what? How is Japan going to adjust to the reality that there is not going to, the North Koreans are not going to give up nuclear weapons? That North Korea is a nuclear weapon state, whether we want to admit it or not. And how do you manage relations with this um, uh, with with this regime? So the basic question is. Does Japan have any real options moving towards 2030 and its fundamental security strategy? And if it does, what is what are? Um, well, thank you very much. Um, just uh, before I answer, I respond to your uh, question. I, I just want to uh, touch upon you know this uh, issue of uh, uh, universal healthcare. Uh, and, and which I think you know has been uh, very successful uh, in Japan. Uh, next year will be a 60th anniversary of uh, universal health uh, insurance scheme uh, in Japan. And uh, you may have missed it, uh, but uh, Prime Minister Abe and the head of uh, WHO, uh, Mr. Tedros, uh, contributed a joint uh, op-ed piece uh, to Washington Post uh, on uh, December 12th of last year, under the title, All Nations Should Have Universal Health Care. So uh, Japanese viewpoint is that it makes sense to have universal health care. Right. And, and, um, and we have been helping uh, other developing countries to introduce uh, uh, this uh, system. And uh, in recent years, uh, only you know, during the last two years, Egypt, South Africa, and the Philippines came on board, and uh, Kenya and, and India uh, uh, are trying to uh, embark on you know more ambitious schemes to expand the access to uh, free you know health uh, services. And, <clears throat> and when we are facing uh, issues like Corona, it is very important you know, to have this kind of uh, uh, basic healthcare system. So. So this is something which we think you know we can offer, and regarding the speed of change uh, in Japan, um, one thing I, I have uh, I, I point out is uh, uh, during the Abe <coughs> administration, uh, we have overcome you know this issue of uh, uh, major FTAs, of course you know TPP or TPP11. 
uh, Japan EU FTA, and and they <clears throat> they have been entered into force, and and we are talking about Japanese uh, uh, agriculture uh, becoming more export export oriented and competitive, and, and uh, uh, you know when you live in New York, uh, New York City, uh, you know how popular Japanese food uh, you know food is, and, and this could be a renewed opportunity uh, for Japanese economy. And uh, at the same time, we are negotiating uh, another uh, mega FTA, which uh, is ASEAN plus six, it's called RCEP. And uh, of course, you know, there's an <clears throat> issue between China and India, uh, and uh, India could drop out, we hope not. Um, uh, and uh, we are also uh, negotiating Japan-China ROK trilateral FTA. And this reflects um, renewed, uh, new reality of supply chains uh, in Asia. And, and the Japanese business uh, wants to engage in different parts of the world you know, for, uh, in order to uh, cope with emerging uh, landscape uh, of uh, uh, global economy. On security issues, um, what I have, you know, personally seen is um, uh, directly working with, uh, uh, say, U U.S. Uh, uh, military service members in Japan, uh, Pentagon people, uh, among others. Uh, I think, you know, those people who are engaged in national security issues tend to understand the you know, strategic importance of uh, U.S. forces in Japan. And the uh, U.S. forces in ROK and U.S. forces in Japan play somewhat different you know, role. Of course, in the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty talks about the Far East, but we have been talking about Asia Pacific and now Indo-Pacific. So, if uh, you know when we see under the Trump administration, you know, trans, uh, uh, renaming Pecom. Uh, uh, you know, in Honolulu in, to uh, indo pecon uh, the Uni United States has uh, uh, material interests uh, in uh, securing uh, prosperity uh, in the Indo-Pacific uh, region. And so, uh, of course, you know, there, there could be different political views to be expressed, and this is something uh, we need to manage uh, in terms of uh, uh, probably you know, sometimes at the top level and uh, explaining uh, the strategic importance of uh, U.S. forces in Japan. And, and uh, uh, I have personally been uh, seeing, uh, for example, you know, Tomodachi operations. Uh, so March uh, 2011, as uh, Professor Ikutani mentioned, I, I was seconded to Prime Minister's office. And um, one thing uh, we faced, major issue that we were facing at that time was uh, uh, destruction of uh, Sendai Airport. So Sendai Airport is a regional hub of Tohoku. So with the destruction of uh, Sendai Airport, we could not transport humanity, you know, the, the goods uh, to to rescue you know those people. Then um, U.S. forces uh, came on board, and there was a I think it was a, U, a U.S. special uh, operation forces, which are tasked to create airports where there are no airports. So what they did is in one month, uh, they, you know, most uh, Japanese officials thought, you know, that this will take half a year uh, to repair, but it was realized in one month. And uh, uh, so, so Japanese, uh, th those Japanese, you know, who have been involved uh, vividly remember uh, that experience. And, and uh, so U.S. forces, uh, especially in Japan, uh, American soft power. And uh, uh, when uh, uh, Japanese government is uh, sharing ne nearly 75% of the cost uh, in terms of uh, broader definition of host nation support, it makes sense for the United States, you know, to, to have an aircraft carrier in uh, Yokosuka, and uh, uh, it's serving uh, in my view, uh, U.S. Uh, nas uh, national uh, interests as well as uh, the, ja the Japanese. And this is something we need to 
uh, keep on discussing. Um, about the US-China uh, 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 relations, um, actually, I, I was uh, uh, working on uh, some of the issues that's related to concrete cooperation, uh, US-Japan uh, cooperation under FOIP, and the possibility of uh, Japanese engagement with the Chinese side uh, as related to uh, China's Belt and Road uh, uh, initiative. From the Japanese viewpoint, we don't want to call them uh, BRI projects because it's not you know, our projects. Uh, we, we want to call it FOIP if possible. But at the end of the day, uh, we agreed between Japan and China that we could look into uh, Japan-China cooperation in the third markets. A and uh, we, uh, Prime Minister Abe ha has come up with uh, four conditions for such cooperation. Transparency, openness, economic viability, and fiscal sustainability. When BRI projects are criticized for you know, debt trap diplomacy, Japan does not want to be associated you know, with those kind of criticism. So uh, the, we, we have our own uh, track record as uh, uh, donors in developing countries. We want to contribute to sustainable development. If be, you know, some of the projects proposed by the Chinese side do not you know, match those criteria, we just can't cooperate. So, so uh, um, I, I think you know, these kind of uh, issues could be well understood you know, by, uh, uh, by, by the U.S., uh, and um, and and of course, you know, we need to continue to uh, collaborate uh, on issues like you know, 5G. And uh, of course, uh, Trump administration has been paying the particular attention of uh, deployment of Huawei uh, in uh, uh, different parts of the world. Uh, the, the Japanese government uh, has been saying that uh, uh, we don't discriminate according to nationality. But uh, we are aware of the need to strengthen uh, our cybersecurity uh, issues. So, so th this is something that uh, we have announced as a, as a policy, and uh, we are implementing it. Thank you. OK, <clears throat> just a final uh, thoughts. Universal health care, what I said it did not imply at all that Japan should reconsider universal health care. The outlier in, on this issue is the United States. You talk about, you know, me Medicare for all is some radical idea. Well, that's what <laughs> all other countries in the world, at least developed countries in the world have. Uh, the problem is not how to get rid of a wonderful system. And I agree, I've, uh, you know, benefited from the Japanese healthcare system and myself living in Japan as much as I, as I do. The question is, how do you make it sustainable? Uh, with this aging population, give you a really interesting uh, number if I got if I got them right. Now. It's not only that there are a lot of people over 65, which isn't all that old anymore. But again, back in 1964, when I lived in Japan, there were 183 people over the age of 100. This year, there are 79,000 people over the age of 100, <clears throat> and they talk about you know, uh, uh, people live, you know, an, an era of 100 year old. How, and they're, they, you know what, the problem about getting old is you get sick. Until you die, you get sick. How do you care for all these, for this huge population of elderly, sick people? Not under this current healthcare system. It will go bust at some point. So that's the, that's, that's the issue of a lot of aspects of Japanese domestic, uh, domestic situation. And on the foreign policy issue, what you said is really is is in, is interesting. And I, you know, if I had to put down my bet, I would say 2030, Japanese security policy will look pretty much like it looks today. Not much change. You know, it's so important for the U.S. to have the alliance with, with Japan. And how, no matter how ignorant the president may be, uh, to to get the Pentagon to accept a policy. That pulls us. That, that that makes it impossible for the U.S. to have this force projection capability, power projection capability in Asia is inconceivable. 
So I, that's not my con that's not what I'm, I, I think we need to be concerned about. Uh, but for Japan, the alliance is so important that it gives Japan much less elbow room than, say, the Germans have or other Europeans have. Look at Huawei. Look at the British special relationship with the United States. Yeah, special relationship in which the British are going, you know, are, are, are letting Huawei in. Japan is not. Japan is much more loyal to the U.S., not because they love the U.S., but because they don't really have much choice. That's why I think things will, you know, will, will probably be pretty much the same. But you didn't answer the question, which is if forced to choose between alliance with the United States and relations with China, what are you going to do? And that's then. Uh, okay. So um, uh, my, my simple answer is, uh, uh, as I mentioned at the outset, you know, Japanese security po policy uh, is uh, based on uh, U.S. alliance as a cornerstone. So, so uh, this is uh, very, very clear. Uh, but at the same time, as a neighbor, we need to manage our relations with China. We don't want to get into conflicts, and uh, that was, uh, you know, sources of concern maybe you know, between 2012 and 2014. And uh, I'm glad that you know our tensions uh, have been reduced uh, uh, during the last uh, a few years. Um, just. Uh, one comment about uh, uh, this um, sustainability of uh, healthcare, uh, the universal healthcare. I understand that uh, uh, inside the Japanese government, there, there has been discussion of uh, uh, requiring, you know, more uh, payments you know, from individual uh, you know, medical uh, treatments. Uh, it used to be like you know, ten percent. Now. For, for average people, you know, 30%. There are exemptions for uh, higher, you know, age group. But uh, uh, given the budget pressure, uh, there, there is uh, more requirements uh, call, you know, for increasing individual uh, medical payment. But still, uh, my personal impression is that if you compare with the U.S. Uh, medical uh, payments, uh, I, I think uh, uh, it's probably much lower, right? And um, uh, so, so uh, uh, I, I take your point, you know, that uh, we need to be attentive to, uh, you know, this sustainability of our system. Uh, and, and, um, uh, and, and also the government is trying to change uh, retirement age as uh, people, you know, uh, live longer and people can work longer. So uh, it doesn't make sense to uh, cut at the age of uh, 60 years old. We, we are moving to 65 five years old. And, uh, and also, many Japanese uh, may wish to continue to work. And, and this is kind of a ikigai, you know, like purpose of your life. So, so uh, it may, maybe those people who continue to work uh, tend to be healthy, you know, like uh, Pro Professor Curtis. Right, so so uh, th this is the kind of a society. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So th so this is the the kind of uh, uh, society you know we, we wish to achieve. You know, like if, if uh, uh, you can continue to work, and co even if uh, your salary could be reduced, you know, some people just choose to work, you know, for their life uh, fulfillment, and, and that's good. And, and um, uh, so, and, and also. We, we are also attentive to the issues of how you don't, you know, become ill. You know, like, uh, this is a very important aspect. Uh, I think, you know, there is a, a better social, uh, the, the societal awareness of, uh, uh, you know, ha having healthy, you know, diet, doing exercise. And uh, so how we could reduce the burdens on uh, medical facilities, you know, especially hospitals, are uh, another important issue. Thank you so much. Um, at this point, I'd like to open the floor for questions. So if you can raise your hand and identify yourself and please wait for the mic because it's live stream, so I need to have everybody's questions um, on the microphone.
Thank you. And uh, uh, I'm a visiting scholar here, and uh, I'm a PhD student from Tsinghua University. Uh, first of all, I want to take this uh, opportunity to uh, thank you, uh, thanks uh, Japan, the generous donation to China at uh, Chinese hard time on co uh, in Corus virus is very generous. Uh, just as uh, we said, um, yeah, uh, that. Uh, uh, if you give uh, give us a little help uh, during the hard time, we will, we will return more. Yeah, and uh, and the and the Japan, uh, we also very happy to see that the Japan and the China's relationship are warmer and warmer. That's as one of the donations from Japan said that uh, a good neighbor is better than uh, a far brother. Yeah, that's that's it. Yeah. And uh, the second is uh, uh, just now I, I hear that you said uh, uh, a Japanese uh, company in China uh, was uh, buried uh, some uh, intelligence uh, intelligence knowledge stolen from Chinese uh, company. I'm uh, uh, I refer to my to my uh, phone and uh, from the net there is no report that uh, if there is uh, that thing I'm sorry for that uh, and I'm ashamed of it I'm very very sorry but uh, uh, I heard uh, that uh, this year, uh, I know that years Chinese has put much effort in uh, combating the illegal uh, illegal stolen intelligent uh, knowledge or something yeah, and have very strict law on it, and uh, uh, try their best to do something in innovation. And we, we want to make ourselves strong. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, and uh, we, I also hear that I also have some some Chi uh, some Japanese uh, schoolmates. Yeah, we also said that. Uh, uh, we, we, I also hear that uh, if there is some future in trade. Then maybe it will blame some other things, and maybe I I I just think maybe it's an excuse of some future in other place. Yeah. So uh, my question is, yeah, my question is, uh, why Japan uh put so much effort in Chinese and uh, set some company in Chinese and uh, uh like a Chinese uh, as a uh, your place to uh, to uh, of market your marketplace or your uh, supply market or something. Why you like Chin Chinese and uh, set some uh, company in Chinese in China? Thank you. If I um, understand your uh, question correctly, um, of course you know for Japan now. Uh, China is the, the biggest uh, uh, trading partner for Japan. And uh, so, so many uh, Japanese companies have uh, invested in China. And of course, you know, this started in 1978 uh, when uh, Mr. Deng Xiaoping uh, came to Japan. And uh, uh, he, uh, when he visited uh, Japan, uh, he visited, uh, as I recall, three companies, Panasonic, uh, Nissan and New Nippon Steel, and uh, uh, Mr. Deng Xiaoping asked, you know, those uh, CEOs of those companies to invest uh, in China uh, with uh, cutting-edge technologies. And of course, you know, this this is uh, thirty some years, you know, after uh, the end of the war, and uh, those uh, leaders, business leaders, probably remember, you know, the war days, war time, and and my. Personal take is uh, they probably felt the you know, moral you know, obligation to help you know China to industrialize, and uh, so I don't think those companies were that uh, attentive you know to intellectual property right pro protection. You know they are kind of willing to uh, support you know China uh, for their in, uh, industrialization. But now at this point of time, I, I take your point, you know, that uh, uh, Chinese intellectual property right protection as a system is getting better. You know, when we read, you know, laws and regulations, you know, they, they look okay. But uh, there are issues of implementations and, and also 
uh, there is uh, uh, there's an issue of uh, kind of provincial uh, implementations. So the center uh, may be very eager to protect IPR, uh, you know, intellectual property right, but maybe some of the provinces may, may not be prepared. But that may be changing, uh, especially because you know some Chinese uh, Chinese companies are having a better brand, and they need to protect, you know, like for example, you know, Baijiu, you know, Maotai, right? So, so that you know, you don't want you know fake uh, uh, Maotai or you know the the white liquor uh, being sold, you know, by other uh, companies. So. Uh, in in my personal engagement with the Chinese side, I, I sense you know that uh, there, there is a better awareness, but but at this point of time, uh, there there are uh, already uh, there, there are still issues. Um, I think you know Japanese companies are, are continuing to be interested in Chinese market, uh, as uh, Professor Curtis mentioned. Uh, you know Japanese uh, domestic demand uh, is uh, uh, shrinking. Uh, in, in many respects, and uh, Japanese companies are going overseas, uh, in, including China. But uh, there, there are competition that China would be facing with uh, other Southeast Asian countries or India. So, uh, the, so this situation, you know, looking back, you know, during the last uh, uh, thirty years or so. Uh, we have seen so many Japanese companies uh, entering the Chinese market, but of course, uh, for the for, for uh, the four years to come, we need to take into account, you know, what will happen in, in terms of Chinese system, U.S.-China trade war, uh, among other things. So, so uh, uh, as I as you mentioned, you know, we we I think you know we have a better. Uh, relations in in terms of being able to communicate more effectively in addressing some of the pending issues, and that may give new opportunities. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your speech. Um, I'm Hoon Hee from a uh, first year MPA student at SIPA um, from South Korea. Um, listening, uh, after listening to your speech, I came to feel like the actually that Japan is in a very similar situation as South Korea in terms of demographic development and also security issues uh, uh, facing North Korea and also we're also aging society. Um, and also one of the points that I uh, felt uh, which felt really similar to Korean situation is that we also ha might be forced to select uh, one or the other between the U.S. and China because U.S. has been our alliance for the entire like several decades uh, for after World War, and China is uh, is the largest economic partner to South Korea. It it takes up almost one fifth of the entire export from South Korea. Uh, so it it kind of makes me feel it it makes more sense and rational for Japan to cooperate with South Korea to really manage this kind of situations. But as you all know, South Korea and Japan have very heavy emotional baggage that prevents both of us to cooperate, like fully engage in cooperation. So uh, how do you foresee the bilateral uh, relationship between Korea and China, and how do you uh, what's what's the role for South Korea? To uh, help Japan and, uh, and for actually both both countries to uh, get uh, push through this situation. Um, I I agree, you know, to your uh, observations, you know, that uh, both uh, Japan and South Korea, you know, face similar uh, challenges. You know, as you mentioned, you know, demography uh, and uh, uh, aging. Uh, Facing uh, North Korean problems and managing uh, alliance uh, relations with the United States, and and so I I agree, you know that uh, uh, especially in the area of uh, uh, security arena, uh, you know it makes sense, you know, for Japan and ROK to closely, you know, more closely cooperate uh, on uh, 
the issues as related to North Korea. And, and uh, so, so this is something you know that, that we you know always wanted in terms of uh, continuation of uh, GSOMIA, you know, like exchange of uh, military intelligence, you know, between uh, Tokyo and Seoul, and. Um, um, and and also in uh, economic terms, um, Japan, Japanese government has been interested in uh, concluding FTA, you know, be between uh, or EPA between Japan and South Korea. Uh, my understanding is that uh, for the South Korean side has not shown you know that you know much interest, and probably uh, the, there was a more priority attached uh, for South Korea to conclude FTA with China. Of course, uh, you know, South Korea has its own diplomacy and foreign, uh, foreign relations. And of course, uh, you, know, you have uh, uh, basically you know, connected you know, through, through the continent. So Japan as an island nation and South Korean situation may be different. Um, but, but as I mentioned, you know, we, we are also working on uh, uh, Japan, China, ROK, uh, FTA, EPA. I used to negotiate uh, investment agreement, you know, among uh, Japan, China, and ROK, uh, which end, uh, entered into force, I guess, around 2012. And uh, in, in my uh, experiences of uh, negotiating uh, that agreement, in many cases, you know, Japan, Japanese negotiators and South Korean negotiators were seeing eye to eye. You know, like my my impression is that South Korean government, after especially concluding FTA with the United States, you know, chorus, uh, and, and liberalize you know many of uh, uh, its domestic market, are in a position to be able to negotiate higher standards of. Uh, uh, economic agreements. So, so uh, uh, for example, after uh, RCEP uh, agree, you know, agreement is uh, reached, when we are negotiating among uh, Japan, ROK, and China, uh, we could encourage China to embrace you know higher standards of agreements. Well, we call it you know RCEP plus. So, so I, I, I would, you know, put it simply that uh, uh, there, there is uh, much, you know, room for cooperation between Japan and ROK, uh, but uh, uh, the, the Prime Minister Abe's view uh, is that uh, we are talking about you know, 1965 basic agreements, and uh, even if uh, South Korean political lands landscape change changes. You know, this agreement you know, basically needs to be honored, and, and that's uh, the, the core message. And, and unless you know this uh, agreement, you know, basic treaty uh, between the two countries is you know uh, is not honored, it's very difficult to uh, have a constructive uh, relationship. Um, thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, we're out of time. So I'd like to ask, um, thank you again for coming. And please join me around an applause to the speaker and our commentators. Thank you.